right, we're good to go. There's my pretzel. Um, all right, so how's everybody doing? Hopefully everybody had a good weekend and is making good progress on PA4. I've talked to a number of people about specific issues and it seems like things are working out. So tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to do open lab during class. So I won't be lecturing on new material, but it's a good time if you want to talk about particular issues with your code and you want to screen share and um, so on and so forth, we can, we can work through stuff then. In addition to my regular office hours, which are every day at three o'clock and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at 11. So plenty of opportunity to get together and, and work on issues with the programming assignment. Um, but, you know, I don't want you having to rush through this at the last minute. So try to get yourself in a good place by tomorrow where either you know how to finish this up or you know what the issues are that you need help with. And we can talk about them tomorrow in class or office hours. Um, and hopefully it's going well for everybody. So any questions on anything up to this point? All right, well, we're gonna switch gears, start something new. So I wanna talk about networking. And this is the next topic in this course. We have three weeks left, okay, a little less than three weeks. And my approximate plan is to spend this week working on networking and any questions that come up on PA4. Friday we'll talk about PA5, which will be networking related. Um, and then next week I want to talk about threading. So threading is the idea of running multiple processes from inside your Java code. And we talked a little about forks and exec and things like that in 224 for creating multiple processes and so on. We can do the same thing in Java. It's a lot easier in Java than it is in C. It's higher level. There's a lot of machinery put around it and it's all done in the language of objects. So it's, it's a very sort of comfortable way to create new processes to do things for us. And we'll be doing some, some threaded programming for PA5 as well. And we've already been doing this when we work with Swing. If you look at the beginning of, of the code that's generated for us by Window Builder, um, it calls a met method called run, right? That's basically creating new threads for us. Because what's happening in, in Window Builder is when, when we're running a Swing based Java GUI, right, your dots program, for example, um, your code is doing something, right, but the user might also be doing something like clicking a mouse, right, and, and when you're not doing anything obvious in your code, when you just return from your mouse handler, there's still something that's running, which is looking for mouse events and calling your mouse handler when, you know, the mouse click happens. Um, that's running in another thread. So your your swing stuff is is inherently you know threaded, and you have multiple processes running at the same time in the Java virtual machine. So we've already been taking advantage of this, and we're gonna we're gonna learn about how to construct threads and manage threads ourselves, and we'll also learn about some of the pitfalls with threaded programming, um, some of the things that can go wrong and um, ways to analyze that. We'll look at something called the dining philosopher's problem, for example. Um, so that, that'll that be um, next week's topic. And then we're down to our final week, which will be tying up loose ends and probably some form of, of presentations for SLPs um, and sort of wrapping it all up, reviewing, and then final exam after that, and then we're done. So coming to the end quickly. Let's talk about networking. 
So computers have been around for a long time. And they've changed shape over time. If you go back to the 50s and the 60s and even a lot of the 70s, computers were these huge machines, right? Large rooms filled with lots of machinery. Um, that was your computer. And the idea of having a computer, you know, in your office was ridiculous. There was no way. Um, the physical size, the power requirements, the cooling requirements, the staff of technical people who would support and maintain the machine while it was running, right? How could you put that in an office? The idea of a computer, you know, in your pocket or in your, your keyboard or your watch, you know, is just insanity. So think of a time when these computers are these huge, huge things um, and people want to use them. How do people interact with this giant machine? Well, they would do it by, by using some sort of, of smaller machine to communicate with it, okay? So when I started programming, um, this, this was a really popular machine to use. It's called a VT100. This is basically a hardware version of PuTTY. So think about what PuTTY is. PuTTY is this program that you run, and while it's running, you can type on your keyboard, and those keys, the ASCII codes for those keys, get sent to a remote machine. And when that remote machine sends ASCII codes back, your PuTTY program displays them on your, your computer's display. Okay, that's what this thing did. You type on here, it would send out ASCII, ASCII would come in, and it would appear on this display. And it was nowhere near as sophisticated as PuTTY, right? It was monochrome, so black background, white text. It was a fixed font. It was a fixed font size. Um, and it was heavy, right? These were hard to move. This was a cathode ray tube, a lot of electronics in here pretty fragile device, right? You would not want to drop this and so on. Um, it's a hardware version of what PuTTY does. Okay, so, so you would have this in your office or in your lab and you could type on it and you could log into a machine and you could send commands and see the results and so on and so forth. And that's, that's kind of in the spirit of what networking is, right? Having, having one machine sitting on your desk talking to another machine sitting in, you know, what was just called the machine room um, where the computer was. All right, so here's a cool thing about these old terminals. Um, and this ties into how networks work today. So there was a wire coming out of the back of this. There was a power cord, of course, but there was a cable coming out of the back that had a whole bunch of little wires inside, right, that would carry the ASCII codes that were being transmitted by this. And it would also receive ASCII codes being sent to this that it would use to display on your, your CRT. And that wire, right, would go into the wall of your lab and it would snake up the wall and go across the ceiling and drop down into the machi machine room with a whole bunch of other cables and it would get connected to the back of the computer. And so when you typed on your keyboard of this VT100, that was the model number, um, it would send those ASCII codes, you know, through this physical wire to the back of the computer where the computer would receive it, okay? But, you know, if you wanted to use this in your office, which didn't have a wire going through the ceiling into the computer room, right, you could take that wire coming out of the back of this and instead hook it up to something called a modem. And the modem would sit next to your phone and basically you could pick up your phone, you could dial a number of another phone in the computer room, the machine room. And when the two phones talked to each other, right, when they connected, you could press a button on your phone so that the signals coming out of this thing's wire would get changed into tones. And those tones would go through the copper of the phone line, probably go to the central switchboard and then come back through and go to the phone in the machine room. And when the machine room wanted to, and it would be changed back into voltage levels there, ones and zeros. And when the machine wanted to send you something, the 
The ones and zeros will get changed into tones, sent through the copper phone lines to the switchboard back to your phone, and your phone would change them into ones and zeros, which would come into the cable in the back of this and it would display the information. And whether I was connecting this directly to the computer through copper wires or through a modem and changing it into tones didn't matter. I could still use this physical device to communicate in exactly the same way with the computer. Okay, VT100, by the way, if you, if you go into PuTTY and you want to do something like clear the screen, you do like escape bracket C, I believe, right? Those are all codes that were developed as part of the VT100 um, line of terminals, and we still use those codes today. Okay, they're they're called VT100 codes. Um, so here's the idea, right? Whatever you're actually using to physically communicate with the computer, you could still use this one device. Okay, so there was a separation of tasks. There was the physical conduit for sending information. And in some cases that was electrical voltages, in some cases it was carrying tones, high tones, low tones, right? And then there was something that communicated that to this piece of hardware and turned it into ones and zeros that this thing understood. Okay, and this is the way networking is set up today. We have these different layers of communication that take place. And so let me give you a, a somewhat simplified view of, of what this data abstraction layer model looks like. Um, we have down here a physical layer. And this is, you know, copper wires running through the ceiling. Or this is... Um, you know, infrared radiation being sent by my remote control. Or this is um, a series of tones being transmitted over the phone line. Or a series of modulations around um, 2.4 gigahertz being used to send Wi-Fi. Okay, so it's, it's the sort of lowest level manipulation of energy and matter to convey information. And sitting on top of that is a data link, which is among other things saying, how do we interpret this physical manipulation of matter and energy as, as data, as ones and zeros? And so for example, on that old VT100, um, the signal coming out of the back would be negative 12 volts or positive 12 volts. And it just, you know, it goes high, it goes low, it goes high. Right, that's what's going across on the physical layer. But how do we interpret those? Well, on this old VT100, using something called RS-232, here's what we said. When this line goes from zero to one, after it's been low for a long time, when you see it rise from a zero to one, start an imaginary clock. Okay, at a fixed predefined frequency, 1200 ticks per second, for example, or 300 ticks per second in my high school, right? And at each of those clock ticks, let's look at this voltage level. So here it's high, here it's low, here it's low, here it's high, it's high, it's low, it's high, it's high, and then it goes low again. And let's interpret those. So it actually did it backwards. We could call this, you know, a one zero zero one one zero one one, and then back to a zero. That's a byte. One zero zero one one zero one one. Where's the least significant bit? Where's the most significant bit? Well, something has to decide that. So let's just say this was least significant bit. So this is the number 1001011011. And after that last bit, I expect it to return back to a zero. Okay, that's something more like a data link layer. That's using this physical medium of high and low voltages to say, hey, let's send a byte of information. Okay, if you're on a Raspberry Pi, or an Arduino, 
you'd use a different approach. You might use a pair of signals called clock, which is just pulsing up and down, and data, serial clock, serial data. And it might say every time that the clock is high, right, let's analyze the data line and see what the value is. So every time the clock goes high, let's look at this data value. There's a zero, one, one, uh, zero, and so on. It's a different protocol. It's called I2C or, or SPI. Um, but when I'm writing my code to send mail from one machine to another, I don't want to be thinking about this. I don't want to be thinking about that. And I absolutely don't want to download a new browser just because somebody changed my physical layer from being an Ethernet cable to being Wi-Fi. Right? So we have these layers of abstraction where up here is, for example, your application, which might be mail, might be Minecraft, might be a web browser, or whatever. And the application layer doesn't care at all what's happening down here. It really just cares what's happening at the next layer. This layer down here takes what's above it and conveys it to what's below it, but it doesn't care about the physical layer. It doesn't care about the application layer. Right? This is another version of modularization. Breaking things into logical pieces and partitioning your, your overall task into these pieces and saying, hey, I want to send a web page Right? I want to get a request from a user and then send out HTML as ASCII text or Unicode text based on the web page they request. I don't want to think about ones and zeros and clocks and voltage levels and all that kind of stuff. So we have this, this abstraction model, okay? these, these abstraction layers. Um, and so this layer above the data link layer is called... Um, it's called the internet layer, or the network layer. And this layer above the network layer is called the transport layer. And these are the most interesting for us. And we're gonna, we're gonna interface directly with the transport layer. But we can also look at the network layer and see what that does. And what we're about to talk about with these has very little to do with what's going on here and down there. Okay, so, so if we just have a terminal connected to a computer in the machine room down the hall, right, we don't really need to get very fancy. We just have a wire, right, um, coming out of the terminal. We have a wire going into the computer. We need to connect them together somehow. Lots of ways to do that. If I'm trying to control my sound bar with a remote, right, I have a transmitter here. I have a receiver on my sound bar. We don't have to get very fancy, okay? But with computers, right, once we start talking about networks, what do we have? We have, you know, billions of computers, right, scattered around the planet, scattered around devices, orbiting in space, right? Um, we want to connect them to one another. And so we need to talk about addressing. How do we um, specify a particular machine that we want to communicate with? And we need to talk about routing. How do we get my information from where I am to where I want it to go? when there's no direct connection there. So these, these are all things that you would dig deep into in a networking course, which is not where we are right now. But I want to just look at two of these, these layers, the network layer and the transport layer. Um, and so um, the government puts out things called RFCs. These are requests for comments, OK? Um, basically, when something is being developed, the government will, will publish a description of what it is that they're working on and what the current proposals are and ask people to comment on it, right? Make suggestions, criticisms, analysis. So these layers were developed in the 70s, okay? But in, in the early 80s, this got pinned down by the government. So. This was done by DARPA, which was the defense version of ARPA, which was the Advanced Research Project Agency. Um, 
and this was the proposal for um, for the network level protocol called Internet Protocol IP. And it's it's not a long document, but it describes pretty much everything there is that you could possibly want to know about the IP layer. So lots of lots of words, um, but also some pictures. So here's kind of a picture of the layering of these protocols. So um, local network protocol, internet protocol, right? Um, this is the transmission layer. This is the application layer. So FTP, that's a file transfer protocol. That's for sending files from one machine to another. Telnet was the old way to log in to a machine from another machine. It's insecure, so we don't use Telnet. We use SSH, but same idea. Um, so there's some excellent ASCII art in here. For example, this is a description of the header of an internet packet, an IP packet. So 32 bits going across, right? So four bytes. Um, version number, four bits. This document describes version four, so you'd see a 0100. This document covers that. Header length, another four bits, okay? Length of the header in 32-bit words. Minimum value for a correct header is five. One, two, three, four, five, and then options and padding, um, and so on. Okay, the main parts that are interesting to us: source address and destination address. How big? Thirty-two bits each. The whole purpose of an IP packet is to send stuff from one machine to another, where the machines are specified using these addresses. What sort of stuff are you sending? That makes no difference to this level of the network. You're just gonna give me some data to send from this address to that address, I'm gonna send it for you. Okay, there's a checksum in here. So you take all of these bits and you combine them in some mathematical way to come up with a 16-bit number, which more or less is unique to that particular combination of bits. Now it's not actually unique because you know, you've got a lot of bits here but chances are, if a few bits change value, if there's noise and some bits flip, you'll get a different checksum. So when this packet is received, the checksum is calculated and compared to what you're telling me the checksum should be. If there's a difference, it's a transmission error. Chances are, if the checksum that I calculate matches the checksum that you sent me, there were no transmission errors. It's not perfect, but it's pretty reliable. All right, what are these addresses? They're 32 bits each. This is that kind of thing. You've seen these numbers before, right? Um, those are IP addresses. So When I tell that to um, to the Linux server, right? It says trying 47.245.10.98. That's the IP address of our Linux machine. So all these internet addresses are four numbers written this way, separated by dots, but each of these is from 0 to 255. It's an 8-bit number, which means four of these is 32 bits. That's the address corresponding to a destination address or a source address. So if I want to send something to the Linux server, I take that address, 47, 245, 1098, right? Expand each of those to 8 bits. That gives me a 32-bit number. I put that in this part of an IP packet and I push it out to the network and what I'm sending will be sent to the Linux machine. If I put in the address of a machine on the space station, it will get sent to the space station. Okay, this is pretty remarkable. It's conveying data from one machine to another. 
But that's really all it's doing. It's not really worried about what the data is. Additionally, this is not reliable. There's no guarantee when you send a piece of information that it actually gets where it's going. That's not part of the protocol. If I'm sending video and I break it up into, you know, a hundred pieces and I send those one after the other, there's no guarantee they'll arrive in the same order I sent them. If I just take the pieces as they arrive and I display them, I'm going to get a jumbled up video. Okay, that's not the responsibility for the network layer. Those details are handled by the transport layer. So the transport layer that we're interested in is TCP, which stands for Transport Control Protocol. And there is an RFC 793 for dealing with transmission control protocol, not transport, transmission control. And same thing, there's a good description of the header right here. So this is the data which is sent following the IP header. Remember the internet protocol packet is saying, take this data, send it to this destination machine. So all I'm doing is conveying to the destination machine this, right? Which is a TCP header followed by some data. And TCP does not care what this data is. Okay, its job is routing data from what's called a source port to a destination port. So what's a port? It basically says who on the sending machine is sending this and to whom on the receiving machine should it be sent. And it's not who a person, it's who a 16-bit number called a port. But there's sequence numbers to order these packets. There's acknowledgement numbers to be able to know if the packet was delivered or not. And there's all sorts of other pieces of information in here. There's an urgent pointer and so on and so forth. Um, and then there's data. All right, so let's look at these ports. These ports are 16-bit numbers. And they basically say, you know, I want to send information from this machine to that machine. But where should it go on that machine? And who is it coming from? Or what is it coming from on this machine? It's coming from a particular port, and it's going to a particular port. OK, so what are these ports? Um, if you're on a Linux machine, you can look under the slash etc directory for a file called services. And this will list a bunch of ports. So here's a port number and here's a protocol. And I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm only going to look at the ones labeled TCP. Those are the ones using TCP IP, right? But for example, there's a port 7, which is labeled echo. And it used to be if you made a connection to port 7 on a machine, you could send it a message and that message would come right back to you. It was an echo check. So you could tell if a machine was alive and responding to your echoes. You could tell if your network was reaching it. You could tell what the turnaround time was and so on and so forth. So a basic echo check. Um, discard is a bit bucket, a null sync, right? You could connect to port 9 on a machine. You could send stuff to it and it would just disappear. You could read from that and there'd be nothing there. So it's like slash dev slash null. Port 11 was system status. You could communicate with that and you could get information about the state of the system. Number of processes, up status, and so on and so forth. Um, Netstat, same thing, but it gives you information about the state of the network. 21, file transmission protocol. Right, so FTP was a program for sending files from one machine to another. Today we use SFTP, it's a secure version of FTP. But basically you could make an FTP connection to a machine and you could say, hey, I'd like you to go into this directory and send me a copy of this file. And it would open the file, pull the contents and send it to you across the network. And before you could do that, it would make you log in. So you'd have to tell it who you are and what your password is. OK, that was not secure. Because remember, you're sending information from one machine to another. You don't get to control how that information is sent. 
you just say I'm coming from this machine I want to go to that machine well you know it might be going from my machine to my router through the cable in the wall to a Comcast facility down the street where it gets sent to a tower somewhere where it gets transmitted to another facility that beams it to a satellite which routes it through a little bar in some you know small town in the Midwest and you know there's no control over how this stuff is transmitted and it used to be you know when you want to log into a machine you would send data it said here's my username here's my password well if anybody looked at that information while it was being transmitted they would see your username and your password and FTP did not encrypt right it was all just plain text so you never find FTP servers running anymore because it's a security problem right you never want to send passwords over the internet um, unless they're encrypted so 23 was a telnet Port. That's how we would log into machines. Same problem, not secure. 22 is a secure version. It understands encryption. And so let's just use these public private key pair to um, authenticate that somebody who is who they say they are without conveying that information over the network. 25, simple mail transfer protocol, SMTP. This was how mail would get sent. So you could connect to port 25 on a machine and you could say, hey, I have some mail for so-and-so coming from this person, please deliver it. And it would say, okay, All right? And so one machine could send mail to another machine this way. It's not terribly secure. And there's no way to authenticate, okay? But all of these ports are still reserved for these, these purposes, okay? Most machines, you won't find anything on these ports. Everybody closes down their ports because there's there's always security possible violations, right, by having ports open. But this was all port based, right? Here's an interesting one, HTTP port 80. What's that? That's the World Wide Web, HTTP. 70 was Gopher, that was an earlier version of the web. Gopher and Archie and all of these were like pre World Wide Web, places to put up web pages, everything was hyperlinked, you could pull them down over a network connection. Port 80 is still used. It's not secure, we usually use 8080 for the secure connections, but plain old HTTP, port 80. So when I run my browser and I ask for a web page, what's happening is that browser program is trying to make a connection to port 80 on whatever machine I've requested. And once it makes that connection, it sends messages in a particular format, and the remote machine running something called a web server sends information back that my browser interprets to display a web page. So when I go to linuxengrcs.com, I'm making a connection to that, that network address, the 40 dot whatever, on port 80, and it's sending back all of this information. And I can still use Telnet to connect to, um, you know, I could try to log into Linux like this. It's not going to let me because Telnet's disabled. But if I try to connect to port 22, that's the SSH, the machine's happy to talk to me with that, that protocol. So it sends me a header, and now it expects me to send it cryptid information describing who's trying to log in. And, you know, I can try sending random stuff, but it's going to say, up, oh, that's not what I was expecting, and it closes the connection. Now, if I go to port 80, I'm talking to the web browser. And if I say something like get index.html, it responds with the contents of the default web page on the Linux server, which is, you know, a bunch of hypertext, all HTTP stuff, and ending with, you know, a link to the course policies document, and then the disclaimer saying, you know, information presented here is deemed to be accurate, we make no guarantee, warranty, or representation, right? This is the web page, and to access it, all you have to do is make a connection to port 80 on the machine. 
And that's really all that the web browser is doing. When I run Chrome or Firefox and I point it to linuxengrcs.com, that's what's happening inside. It's making a connection to port 80. So I can connect to the mail server on our, our Linux machine, right? That's port 25. And it tells me this is, you know, talking SMTP. And I can say, hello, um, I don't know, what's my name today? Um, I'll be Bart. And it tells me that it's localhost.local .local domain. And I can say mail from um, the president. And it'll say, okay, it's mail from the president. And I can say recipient goes to Nick. And it'll say, okay. And I don't even remember how to do this anymore. Message, uh, body, text, mm, data. Okay, so now it wants the body of the message. And I can say from the president. to Nick, um, subject, hello there, hi, nice to meet you, and then it says end with carriage return line feed followed by a period followed by carriage return line feed, and it's queued up that mail, and then I can say I think quit, and it says hey I have mail. Right? Who I have? I have mail from the president. Let's go read my mail. Hey, there's a message from uh, from the president. Right? Going to Nick. Right? That's all that any of this stuff is. It's just data. Um, it feels like a lot more because there's so many layers wrapped around it. Right? But ultimately, it's just ones and zeros. In this case, being pushed around from machine to machine. And, you know, my machine has no way of knowing where this stuff came from. Um, if you want to forge this stuff, it's really easy to do because, you know, it's just taking what you send it and putting it into a, a format. So, you know, if you look at the headers, you can see, you know, this was sent from localhost.local .local domain, right? But, um, you know, this is how spoofs are done. If you look at this in a regular mail client, um, it suppresses all of these details and you just say, oh, it's mail from the president the wanting my social security number. I better go ahead and send that, you know. And that's how this stuff happens. Um, all right, so, um, so we can make connections to ports and that's basically um, where all of this stuff uh, comes from. All right, so let me mention a couple of tools. I already mentioned Telnet, right? Telnet you can download if you have a Linux machine. Um, right, I've already got Telnet installed, but if you, if you don't, you can say sudo apt-get install Telnet, and it'll download this program for you. Um, Right. It's a bunch of links. But there we go. It's a tiny little program, right? It's 111K. It's written in C. You can download the source code. Um, and, um, you know, you basically say telnet and you put in a name or address of a host and you optionally put in a port number you want to connect to and it establishes a connection. So I can try to tell that to google.com um, but google.com is not going to let me tell that in, right? 
Um, but if they had a server running that was listening for telnet connections, right, that would that would let me in. If they had a mail, mail client running, that would let me talk to their mail client. Um, that gets me to their web page, their web browser, right? But I don't think I can just get HTML pages. I mean, I get all of this stuff. And if I were to run that through a web browser, I'd get something probably saying like, you know, connect to the HTTPS site um, and so on. So Telnet is a really useful utility to have in your toolkit, okay? Um, you'll read things online saying, you know, don't ever use Telnet, delete it and burn your computer because it's really insecure, right? Telnet is not inherently insecure. Telnet just takes information and sends it to a port on a machine, okay? If you decide to use Telnet to send your password to a machine, you're doing something insecure, but Telnet's a useful utility, okay? And as we're developing network code, um, we're going to be writing things like Telnet and things like the mail server, right? But it's useful to have Telnet around to do half the task for us while we're developing and debugging. It's an easy way to make a connection to, um, to code you're running and send information out and get information back. So Telnet's a good, a good tool in your, uh, your toolbox. Um, and there's, there's lots of, of good support for this under Unix. You can do this stuff under Windows too, um, but it's, it's more natural under Linux. Um, so another good um, utility to know is netstat. This shows you network status. And if you say netstat, you get a whole bunch of information, right? Um, I should have just piped it through more. So, um, TCP is the protocol for these, right? TCP version six is the protocol for these. Um, the local address, so that's the name of my laptop, Nick Nitro AN517. This is the foreign address. I've made a connection to 7035.202.249 using the SSH port, and I'm in the state time wait, which means the connection has closed and it's, it's in the process of shutting down. Here's a connection that's established from me going to this web address on the HTTPS port, which is probably 8080. I've got a web browser somewhere talking to this address. I've got another one talking to this and another web page going here, which is closing and so on and so forth. All of your network activity is revealed in Netstat, right? And the ones that start with TCP or TCP6 are the ones that we're gonna be most interested in. Um, Here's, here's a connection from my local host um, port 1939 to a local host port 59174. Well, that's, that's all stuff for this virtual ecosystem that I'm running. I have a, a server running that's serving up random bits from a lab in Switzerland and using that to inject free will into this virtual ecosystem. Um, and I can see the remnants of my poorly written code because I have a bunch of these things sitting in a time wait state. Um, and so on. So, and there's there's other protocols in here. There's there's datagram type connections and uh, UDP and so on and so forth. But we'll mostly talk about TCP and IP. Um, let's talk about addresses. So, um, this IP packet. Right, source address, destination address, 32 bits, right? That's this, you know, four part thing. Well, 32 bits, that's four billion possible addresses. We ran out of address space, you know, about a decade ago because we exceeded four million, four billion unique things that we wanted to have on the internet. Um, and that's a problem, right? So IPv6 uses a bigger address space it's a different version of this that handles, um, I think, 48 bits worth of address space, um, which gets us a lot more breathing room. In the 70s, when this was being developed, 32 bits was considered, you know, way more than you could ever possibly need, right? But there was discussion about it. Should we, should we make this longer? Should we make it 48 bits, 64 bits? 
should we cut it back to 16 bits, you know? And and they settled on 32, and a talk I heard by Vince Cerf, who was one of the early people working on this, he said that um, the argument he made that finally settled the dispute was, let's do 32 for now, and if it works, then we can go back and change it, right? And 50 years later, it was still 32 bits, and we ran out of space, and so this got expanded. Um, but that's, that's your IP address right there, basically. And IPv version 6 um, uses, you know, this other kind of, of address. Um, like this. All right, so it's a six part address. Um, the other nice thing on that net stat is if you say dash n, it gets rid of all the interpretation and it just shows you bare numbers. So here's my machine's local address. Here's what it's connected to. And the other thing is these addresses, these are not internet addresses. If you try to tell net to 192.168.020, you will not reach my machine. You'll probably reach one of your machines. Okay, this is an address in my little home local network called an intranet, right? But my router, which is building this network for me, has an actual internet address. And that's what gets connected to other machines on the internet. But within that router, right, it can take information coming to it from another machine and it can send it to this address, which is my laptop or a different address, which is my phone, or a different address, which is my TV, and so on, right? So all of the stuff really comes down to um, network machine addresses and then port numbers. And these, these five-digit things, these are all port numbers, these are all port numbers. Okay, and different port numbers, 22 means a secure shell connection, 443 is a web connection, and so on, uh, web page connection, and so on. 1939 is the connection for my random bit server that I have running here. So what I want to do Thursday is start looking at how we deal with all of the stuff in Java. How do we make a connection from one machine to another, from one port to another? And that's going to come down to the question of sockets. So we'll look at what sockets are and we'll see how we use Java to, to create and connect sockets to each other. And it's really easy in Java, okay? In C, it's pretty nightmarish. Um, Java, because it's you know higher level and it's got the language of objects, um, it's really just a few calls to methods and we can get a connection hooked up and start sending and receiving information to other machines. Um, and that's what we're gonna do for PA5. We're gonna be doing a networked project. All right, so open lab tomorrow. Um, bring your questions, let's work on PA4, get that finished up, and then uh, Thursday we'll talk about uh, sockets and servers and client server models and so on, and then Friday we'll talk about PA5. All right, and I got office hours today at 3. If you want to talk, we can continue there. Otherwise, have a great afternoon. I will see you next time.